Hi, my name is Jordan Marshall and I'm Special Projects Editor at Building Magazine. Um, I'd love to just welcome you all to today's webinar. It's, it's shaping up to be a great one, I think, really um, insightful content coming your way. Um, so the topic is how can firms manage the golden thread? And we have a really great panel for you today. We've got Ben Wallbank, who's BIM Strategy and Partnership Manager at Trimble Viewpoint. Um, Gary Neal, Head of Fire Safety at Scanscar. And Chris Channel, Director of Hydrox um, Fire Safety Division. Um, so just to run through a bit of how today's going to run to kick things off, each of our speakers is going to give a presentation on the topic, um, run you through the, some overviews of the key points. Um, and then we're going to come together for a Q&A. And we really want our audience to get involved today. Um, so please send through questions at any time and we will try and work through as many of those as possible. Um, also, because we always get this a lot, particularly on topics like this, yes, the session will be available on demand for you to catch up on anything that you've missed or pass on to a colleague. It'll be available via the same link you've joined today on um, and it will be available within about 60 minutes of the session concluding. So if there's anything you want to revisit um, or follow up on, um, it will be available online. Um, that's probably really enough for me to start things off. I think we're going to start with Ben, um, who's going to kick things off today for us. Um, so Ben, I'm going to hand over to you. Fine. Can you see my screen? Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Okay. Um, so my name is Ben Wallbank. I'm the BIM Strategy and Partnerships Manager at Trimble Viewpoint. And you can see that um, I'm actually an architect by background. I was just... Uh, chatting with the guys here and saying, well, God, you know, I was involved in a high rise um, project some probably 10 years ago now, uh, which was a re-cladding job. And I'm struggling to even remember uh, who the cladding company was, but I can certainly remember that fire was an issue. And, uh, you know, were we um, sold horse meat rather than beef lasagna as, uh, um, the uh, Studio 5 architect said, I frankly have no idea. So there, but for the grace of God, I suspect, um, uh, we go. Uh, but I was going to start um, just by saying what, I, what, we, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so the first thing, I'm just going to take a, a brief moment to talk about why we need to take this so seriously. Uh, I'll talk about regulation. I'll talk about the particular challenges for the construction industry uh, for managing this. I'll talk about whether there is or can ever be a single source of truth for information. And I'll talk a little bit about the standards that we have available to, um, that I think can help us. Uh, and then I'll finish off uh, talking a little bit about uh, we are um, common data uh, environment providers. I'll talk a little bit, tiny bit about uh, Trimble Solutions and about how common data environments can help um, with some of these topics. So I was going to, here was going to be a video um, of firemen approaching Grenfell Tower. Uh, and I think quite rightly, building thought it was just too sensitive to, to show, um, you know, 71 people lost their lives in the Grenfell Tower. And time and time again in the, in the video, you hear the firemen saying in disbelief, how is that possible? And that's really the question that had to be answered. And, and uh, um, I would argue that uh, this is not just something with legal and financial implications for our firms, um, but that wanting to prevent anything like this happening in any context in our industry, whether regulated or not, is a moral issue for us all. So I think it, you know it, 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 it's really important that we try to grasp that it's um, that having a way of understanding what for instance happened on that job i worked in 10 years ago is really important uh, both in terms of understanding a particular problem on a particular project but also in terms of understanding how we move forward and make our industry safer for our uh for our customers and clients um so um, Dame Judith Hackett was charged with trying to work out um, how that was possible. Now, I, again, I would argue that her remit was very narrow, um, whether we should have looked more at the governmental and regulation and, and, uh, and um, you know, building regulation uh, supervision side of things as well. Uh, I think we can make an argument for that. But she came up with a very good report 
um, on the remit that she had and said in particular one one bit there needs to be a golden thread for all complex and high-risk building projects so that the original design intent is preserved and recorded and any change changes going through a formal review process involving people who are competent and understand the key key features of the design and really what that meant is you know why has change occurred and what was the approval process what are the gaps in information uh, the need to have that obtainable um, in retrospect and of course she's saying that there needs to be a clear way to digitally record we are now in a digital age record store and hand over the information needed to allow a building to be safely used and operated in future so those were really the key the, the key points and out of that has come some regulation uh, the building safety bill was passed in July 2020, and a sent of it is really any time now, um, I, I believe through to July this year. Uh, and it mandates that fire and structural safety information should be held digitally, including, so, so this is now, re remember the difference between a regulation and a standard. A regulation is, is legal, legally binding. A standard is something that you can choose to adopt if you wish to. Um, so it mandates that fire and structural safety information should be held digitally, um, including the need for robust information management. And it applies at the moment only to high-rise residential buildings, hospitals and care homes. So, I, you know, again, um, whether we as an industry should be applying these um, types of uh, structures which are advised more widely, I think is, a, it, it is something that we all ought to consider. Uh, and there is intent indeed to widen the scope of this over time. Um, and greater regulation of CDE maintenance and thread content. So do we have a particular challenge in our industry? And, and this is a, a study that was done on uh, distribution. You can see that, you know, compared with a lot of other industries, the construction industry in the middle looks very different. And the reason for that is it's dispersed connectedness among employees, that there are few centralized nodes, and that the central ones are connected with different building sites, and that there's a high presence of, you know, the, um, the building industry has, has long supply chains, so high presence of parties outside the organization of each building site. And that makes this, this task of assembling and keeping all of this information somewhat harder than it is for other industries. And of course, it's not just companies and people. So you can't have something that talks about the digitization of our industry um, without silos, of course. Uh, so you can tick your BIM bingo um, uh, a card now. Uh, but it's not just companies and people who are siloed, but data too. So we need to think very carefully about how we transfer data. And certainly as a software company, that's one of our greatest concerns now, is how we begin to move data more fluidly between different products. And of course, this is all like herding cats. Uh, so we've got, a, got, a, got quite, a, quite a task in front of us. And we should all feel really frightened about, about this. You know, this is, this is a, difficult, a difficult thing to pull together. And I hope that uh, some of the contributors after me will talk about how they're beginning to do that. But to do that, uh, you really do need a common data environment, whether it's ours or some of our competitors. And a common data environment should provide access to the same information at the same time for all, all parties invited onto it. It should control the collaborative processes. It should provide visibility of team performance and provide a single source of your truth. Uh, and I'll come along uh, a little bit more to that in a, in, a, in a minute. And of course, it should help you define what deliverable rules ought to be, monitor whether they're going to be um, uh, uh, monitor whether they are being delivered, validate them, in other words, take them through approvals processes, which are really importantly able to be um, uh, able to be recorded so that you have this thread of all the information running through things. And this should be, of course, for files, or as we are now supposed to call them, information containers uh, for models and for data. So a common data environment allows you to start pulling some of this together. But a common data environment 
needs somebody to structure it in a way that your particular necessary approvals processes are set up. So those are the workflows that items go through and the notifications, again, so that that whole process is recorded. But, so here's, here's a government diagram from a few years ago now. Um, and this clearly shows that in fact, we have multiple CDEs, multiple common data environments, which relate to our particular point um, in, in the process. So are we, are we CapEx organizations or are we part of the OPEX? You know the the the, the management and and, uh, uh, and of the asset itself, and so there will be different CDEs at different stages, um, and each party needs to understand what it is that they are required or they should record for the common good. And I think that actually there are standards out there that can really help us so i would particularly point to uh, bs en iso 19650 which requires a cde be provided for both capex and the opex period and also asks that um, parties understand what information they need to make decisions so they it, it requires um organizations to assess in an organization information requirements document, what is it that we need to know or are going to need to know, both again legally and to answer, answer key questions. And then you can define what you need on a project in your exchange information requirements, your EIRs. So no matter whether you have a CD or not, you are going to need to do these additional things as well to to define what it is that you want to collect and need to collect. And of course, by doing this, by, by using the standards as well as your, your, um, what, what you're required to do by regulation, you help to protect yourself if there is a problem for your professional indemnity insurance. Um, you, know, you can then go back and say, well, look, we've, we've been acting in accordance with the best uh, advice that, we, that we've been given at this time. Um, so now I, I get to do the little bit about um, the, the software industry. Um, so I think it is very telling that, you know, compared with uh, other sectors, um, uh, cons the construction sector, despite its size, spends an enormously small amount com compared with other sectors on IT. Um, so, you know, you'll now be thinking, well, he's just trying to sell us, sell us some stuff. And I am, of course. <laughs> um, so. Uh, in Trimble, we have uh, a, a variety of um, uh, products which we are making huge efforts at the moment to make more uh, more fluid in terms of the of the data running between them. Uh, in particular, Viewpoint for Projects is our is our our high end CDE. We also have a a, a CDE aimed more at the tier twos um, team and uh, a a. Uh, uh, Field view is for the collection of site-based data, so mobile, uh, mobile device, and, and these these indeed linked together. So um, that that's it from me. I'm going to now uh, leave you in the capable hands of those who will talk in much more detail about the particular challenges that we're facing with the new regulations coming in. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. I think that was a really great way to kick things off. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris without too much ado, just so that we can keep getting through this because there's questions already starting to come in. Um, but to our audience, please do feel free to send those through at any time. Um, we'd love to you know, get as many of them in as possible. So thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jordan and Builder Magazine for the invite today. Hopefully you can see my slide, can you, without the notes? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Perfect, great, okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so topic of the day, how can firms manage the golden thread? And what I'd like to talk to you about, um, it actually moves quite nicely on for what Ben was talking about, the principles of uh, how we would deliver on this, some of the practicalities. Um, so give you a bit of uh, a bit of context. What, what do we mean by a golden thread? Well, anyone who's uh, surveyed an existing building either under the RRO or change of use, will know that the quality and availability of information is very poor, to say the least. 
as built plans are often out to, out of date and inaccurate, design specification strategies are not handed over, and the O&M manuals often have content that don't reflect the design intent. By not having the design specifics readily available throughout the life of the building, how can end users be capable or, or able to make the right decisions around uh, armed with the necessary information? Well, the golden thread uh, very much intends to overcome that. By having a digital record of all the safety systems within a building, the person tasked with operating safety can be armed with the necessary details to quantify a level, a level, an acceptable level of safety. As data is captured throughout the transition between the procurement stages, as we see here, design, build, and occupation, um, there should be a smooth transition and the content maintained. So Ben's already touched on this uh, about the legislation, but I'll skim through this so we get to the main point. But yeah, after the Grenfell fire, um, Dame Judith Hackett was commissioned by the government uh, and her, her aim was to undertake an independent review of building regulations and fire safety. She made a number of recommendations. The one recommendation we're going to talk about today is the golden thread. Um, however, the, re the review has led to the creation of this new legislation. So four years after the Grenfell disaster, the Building and Safety Bill was introduced to Parliament. Uh, it's intended to be a UK-wide piece of legislation. However, the majority of it will apply to England. The revised bill was published in February last year, and it's currently in the second reading. As Ben says, it's, it's intended to have his word assent sometime before July. And the Act is anticipated to be in place by the end of this year, with, the, with all the legislation expected to be active and enforced by October 23, or between October 23 and January 24. And there's an expectation there's going to be a transition period throughout 2024. So the, the intention of the bill is to address the lack of accountability within build, design and occupation of high-rise residential buildings by ensuring that there's a nominated individual identified throughout the life of the building. During the build, design and the build, the client, the principal designer, the principal contractor, and then throughout occupation, the accountable person and their building safety manager. Now, I know the building safety manager has been taken out of the legislation recently by Mr. Gove, but I still think that role will be necessary. And however it's called, that person is going to be tasked with operating and maintaining a building safety case. It's a requirement that competent people, uh, professionals are going to need to be engaged to undertake a review of fire safety and structural safety. The fundamental to this will be maintaining a level of safety will be the digital record of the assets. Under the bill, there will now be an obligation to create a digital record of all high-rise residential buildings. And this can be achieved by creating a golden thread of information throughout the design, build, and ongoing throughout the, the occupation of that building. Data will be captured during the initial design through the build and then include any changes that occur throughout occupation. This package of building information will be used by the duty holders to demonstrate to the regulator an adequate level of safety for the building throughout the life for its life cycle. So we've split this across the various stages of delivery of a project. During planning, key to ensuring the right information is captured in the correct format will be the involvement of the accountable person and their building safety manager at the very commencement of the design. Their input pre-planning will be required to set in place a project brief. This brief will be used to create a platform for data capture in a format that can be transferred into the accountable person's asset information model. During design, key to this will be what information and in what format can be expected to be collected during concept schematic and detailed design stages. Suitably competent teams will need to be appointed to collect the data, and an equally competent team will need to sit client side to validate this collection. Input into a separate asset information model, and I say separate as opposed, as opposed to the um, usual BIM models delivered on projects, uh, will be generated and dedicated platform created to capture data during the design. The, this separate asset information model will be, will be catered to align with the format of the accountable person's asset information model. Now that again is key because um, the current BIM models are very much design focused, looking at coordination and efficiency, whereas the asset information model is intended for the end user or the, the accountable person's uh, safety case. They'll require dedicated building information managers to validate the content being generated to ensure it meets with the brief and the design program will need to account for this review period at each of the client approval points. 
Much like the building information manager, it's expected that a safety case author will need to be validating the data being captured throughout um, the, the client approval periods. And with an appropriate brief set during planning, an itemized data list should be available to the design team, which can be validated by a client representative, such as the building safety manager or the safety case author. Much like during design, within build, input to the asset information model will need to be continued, but the primary difference will be the from the design stage is the need to record installations on site and monitor what systems are actually being utilized. It's expected a dedicated clerk of works will be on site full time to record and itemize systems that will be operated and maintained by the building safety case. During the build stage, the collection of this data by both the BIM manager and the clerk of works will need to be validated. This will either be a continual oversight for larger, more complicated projects, or periodically for less challenging sites. And again, that's supposed to, I expect that to sit client side. And then at the end of, uh, at the, end of the, the build, at uh, gateway three, the client then hands over the golden thread to the accountable person. And with this, they apply for a building assurance certificate and, and they appoint a building safety manager to operate and maintain the safety case. So how can clients, principal designers and principal contractors capture this data effectively? Well, here's a platform that we've been developing. I'll run a video now. Um, this is a Hydrock platform. It's very much in its in, in, in inception stages. But the intention is that this will be a 3D representation created throughout the design. Um, and then one on site there'll be photographic records taken during the build. Uh, and the input parameters for each of the aspects, aspects being the fire protection systems and the structural design, uh, have been very much taken from the BS 8644 series, but I'm um, sorry, the, the standard, but that's very much at risk because uh, that hasn't been published as yet. And as you can see with the certification uh, competency of install installers we measured against the BSI Flex 8670 series. And all the while, the intent of this is that the um, this offers an asset information model for the accountable person to operate their safety case in the building. And that's it. I'll hand over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Gary. Thanks, Brilliant. Chris. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chris. Can I just jump in with one question? Just we had a couple of people ask, um, and it would just probably be good to get it clarified now, if that's okay. Just in that. Um, flow chart that you were showing of the different gateways in the planning stage there was um the word has it and people a couple of people were asking what that was and if you could elaborate on what that point was yeah well i've, I've only got eight minutes to do our presentation so that's what that's uh, we've got yeah. a couple no, of no, working I groups <laughs> at the minute um that we're, we're but we had about, we about five well, people asked so i thought i might as well no, <laughs> put it to you. So, so one of the one of the um the requirements of this for the safety case would well, have a record of the decisions that are made throughout the design. So when you are tasked with operating a safety case in a building, you have to be armed with why was that particular system installed and what's its intent. And also as well, um, the platform will offer you the ability to quantify a level of safety in the building. And that has to come from a hazard identification exercise. As ID exercise is very much recording what hazards are around the site, within the building, um, throughout design, throughout build, throughout occupation and then record the decisions around what mitigation measures you have in place for that. Um, but I mean, that's a whole separate presentation. So, I mean, uh, maybe <laughs> no, we can that's, do that's another session another time. Absolutely. Um, brilliant. OK, now I will hand over to Gary because um, there's still plenty of questions coming in more broadly. So um, please keep those coming in. We'll try and get as many of those covered off in the Q&A next. OK, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can, can, uh, can you see my screen, presentation screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, good. All right. Uh, so as the slide says, my name's Gary Neal and I'm head of fire for Skanska UK. Um, and Skanska, we, we are a large tier one contractor and um, and we, we have a real strong focus on fire. Um, so just by way of introduction, uh, I, I'm very pleased to say that fire safety is at the very heart of Skanska's values. And, and we know that really for us to del deliver fire safe uh, buildings and uh, good construction, we need to be properly aligned. Now, we've heard Chris and Ben talk earlier about 
um, systems and process and the uh, common data environment. Chris had some uh, a short presentation there with some really good graphics, some of them a 3D model. Uh, you're not really going to get anything exciting like that for me. I'm just going to tell you how uh, Skanks would do it, uh, what we think we need to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we need to do before we even get to the common date environment, what we need to do before we start storing our information, thinking about our regulations. Because we need to think about a sound platform for construction. We can have all the good recording tools in the world, but if we haven't built a safe building uh, based on traceable competence, clear, concise design, good certified product selection, and a supply chain UCAS third party accreditation. We know we, we can't deliver the standards needed from us and those of our customers. So we've, we've embedded those principles within Skanska and we've got the confidence that we consistently deliver fire safe buildings in all sectors. We've heard a lot about um, new regulations and so, and so on. And it, at the moment, those regulations are all about uh, residential high rise. And um, a large part of Skanska's uh, portfolio of construction is everything outside of high rise residential. We have HS2, Crossrail, infrastructure, landmark buildings, uh, housing, but not, not nothing that you would call a high rise uh, resi that, that the new regulations focus on. But that aside, we have embedded all of those principles into what we do in Skanska every day. So when that, that test of the, the new bill uh, runs through its, its due course and that spot starts to filter down to the wider construction, we know we'll be ready for that. Um, because we know that as a construction industry, we need to restore public confidence. We all saw those horrible uh, pictures uh, of Grenfell and I think that was a low point in, in recent construction. Um, and public confidence is low. Uh, there's people now in, in, in high rise buildings with the wrong cladding, their lives at risk, their financial confidence is at risk. Uh, and we need to make sure that we understand what those cultural and behavioral changes, what what's required, and we need to know how we're gonna deliver those. So we, we like to really think about some really basic principles it's not too uh, technology driven. They're just basic things we need to do, which we think the industry sometimes misses. So I know uh, that to deliver a safe building, we need to first and foremost have a really sound, robust fire strategy. That fire strategy must be produced by a competent and experienced fire engineer. And the point that's often missed is it needs to cover all of the current REBA stages. That's from concept right out to delivery. Not just a part in the middle of those REBA stages sits around 4A, 4B. We need to know something. We need to have a strategy that comes and lives with a project. So we get to the end of the project and we've got an as-built fire strategy that changes all the language from we will do this to we did do that. And that kind of sits on top of our, our information portfolio. This is a fire strategy that says we did do this. And then we have the evidence to support that. We need, to, we need to look again at design. Um, I think all of us involved in design or receive it on the receiving end of design would be very aware of the obvious gaps that we've all become used to seeing. Um, too much design is pushed forward into later REBA construction phases under the guise of uh, contractors design portion. Too many gaps are opening up. We need to close that down and really design a building to a very concise level of detail. Talk about the products we're going to use, use the BIM models and the technology we've got to start getting that clear vision that we, we only start building something when we've correctly and fully designed something, because that's not temp typically the habit in construction industry. We need to look at products. Uh, there's a lot of products out there, which always shocks me to know that are sold as fire products. They could be dampers, ducts, any element of fire product you can think about. When you dig down and scratch below the surface, they're untested. There's no certification. That means we as the user would be at risk in applying those products. But those companies that sell those products seem to be able to go unchecked. Uh, hopefully, the plans in the future for the construction product regulator will bring that under control 
and we can have more confidence in the products we use. We need to think about our supply chain. We need to make sure and keep in mind that the regulator reform order requires the responsible person to employ competent persons. So at Skanska, our measure of competence is not my opinion or someone else's opinion, it's UCAS third party accreditation. All of our fire contractors, anything from compartment walls, fire extinguishers, sprinklers, fire alarms, cladding, whatever element of fire you can think of, we insist that they hold UCAS third party accreditation in the discipline they're supplying. At the moment, there's five or so accreditation bodies. They offer about 15 schemes each. So there's around about 60, 75 opportunities to get that wrong. Because often a contractor will start off with an accreditation for a very specific element. And if not careful, they're taken on jobs outside of their accreditation. We need to check that and check and check again. We need to look about and think about certification. Uh, we need to, before we start a project, we should understand what certification looks like. Um, so when we are post completion, uh, we need to have that certification readily available and it needs to be very specific to the works carried out. And then all of that feeds into our record keeping. Uh, and you know, we would call that regulation 38, building regs compliance, which is all what we've talked about this morning or this afternoon rather. Uh, and we need to use common data platforms for that. I acknowledge that we use, need to use technology for that. But of course, unless we've got the fire strategy design product supply chain and certification correct, we're never going to end up with a strong, valuable and usable Regulation 38 folder. So what's our approach? Um, well, first of all, uh, people need to be skilled and competent. So we provide fire engineering awareness training to all Scansa staff. That includes procurement, commercial design and the construction teams. This is not just about coalface working, it's about everyone in the team having, having an awareness. We produce fire procedures that cover regulation and legal responsibility, correct selection and appointment of supply chain, fire strategy design, benchmarking, quality control, golden rules and our record keeping. So we take our staff through that process and we provide training and procedure for that. And our procedures provide comprehensive guidance on the processes that must be followed. And we know if we follow those procedures, we can deliver a high quality fire safe and regulation compliant building. We've pushed further with our supply chain and we've created a fire consultant framework. And that includes fire engineer, engineering specialists assess for competence formal qualification and experience in the construction sector. And that's important. A good consultant <coughs> working outside of the remit, remit will not provide a compliant solution. So it, we need to drill down. We need to just not take it as granted that a consultant knows all we need to know. We need to question, challenge, understand, and make sure we've engaged the right partners. And as I said, we have uh, procedures. So we, we've got a, a particular procedure that I manage and I'm, I'm very proud to promote within the business is our fire protection verification procedure. And that takes people through legal compliance. It requires the appointment of a project fire coordinator. It determines minimum standards, consistency approach, promoting good practice, the golden thread, which we're talking about today, and it removes risk and exposure. Along with that, <coughs> excuse me. Along with that, we need to think about design development. For us to deliver a compliant building, we need to agree service routes and minimise firewall penetrations at an early stage. Think about material specification, minimise options, standardise materials and interfaces. And compliance, we need clear evidence, not just opinion. Third party tested verification. There's plenty of test houses out there, and we need to see that evidence. And we only apply tested and approved standard details. Then once, we've, once we know where we are with our projects, then we can start to think about site implementation. That really brings us into quality control and assurance, samples, benchmarks, QA inspections, robust records and certification 
determining our regulation 38 folder structure, identifying our containers, start to um, populate those with our records just from day one, changing the proposed products into the approved products, running those through to the used products and their certification. We need to keep construction product regulations, CE marking in mind. That will shortly be UK CA marking. Are all of our products CA marked, CE marked? Have they got declarations of performance? Are we using those products in line with those declarations of performance? You'd be surprised how often contractors aren't. Con competent certified sub subcontract companies and operatives with UCAS accreditation. We talked about that a couple of slides ago, but um, we need to keep that in mind because they're at the coalface, they're delivering our design, our products. Good design and a good product installed badly will have a bad outcome. So it's, we need to think about these things in the round and always coming back to correct design responsibility, make sure we've got clear, concise, concise design and appropriate PI cover. If someone's designing something that they haven't got knowledge and skill in, I question whether their PI cover would actually cover the work that they've provided. So we need to check that, is it the right level of cover and does it cover the full scope of works? So that's me at my last slide. Um, and the, my purpose there was just to take you through the, the sort of pathway that, that scans could take. It's practical. It's about delivering strongly strong solutions at the coalface and it considers all things in the round. Uh, and I think if we do that, then we can publish a really strong uh, golden thread of information at the end of the project and uh, take that building through the rest of its life for many years to come. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much. And thank you all for those presentations. I think that's provided a really great um, kickoff point. Certainly from the questions we have coming in, there is plenty. Um, so I will jump into those now, but just quickly in case, because we have had this a couple of times come in and just in case anybody missed at the start, yes, you'll be able to catch up on demand. You'll be able to see all the slides on demand. Um, just give us an hour and you'll be able to access it via the same link you've joined today. And you can pass that on and it'll still be um, available um, free. So yes, within about 60 minutes of us wrapping up, you'll be able to watch it all over again. Um, so we've had a few, I'm going to try and bundle some of these questions together um, to try and cover off as many as we can. So we've had a few questions um, about management of um, the golden thread through the supply chain and the idea of, um, you know, interoperability between different systems and that sort of thing. Um, do you, do you guys see there as being you know significant cha challenges due to like the traditionally siloed nature of the way construction operates and how can that sort of be overcome when we're talking about moving everything into one you know golden thread of truth so for me jordan um so i i see a lot of construction projects uh and people are collecting information in silos and uh, for years, we've collected information and bundled it up into o and manuals. And there's no interconnection between related services. They're very disjointed silos. So I think what, what technology is going to bring us is the, that opportunity to meld those, those, that silo, those silos of information together at the start of a project. But for me, the key thing is that we do that at the start of the project. All too often we get to the end of the project and there's piles of various information which gets tried to squash together by technical authors. And that's all too late, that's a real challenge. So I think it's a day one thing before construction starts, set the parameters, set the framework in the design and start to populate that from day one. Otherwise threads of, it, threads of information are squirreled away into people's laptops uh, and that they're not on shared drives and, and we lose that information at the end. Excellent. Does anyone I think, have any? I think, it's a, it's, I think it's, a, it's a really good question because um, it's what Hackett's talking about in her report, like it's changing culture. You know, that, that, that we do, we have historically had multiple disciplines throughout design, then go to a contract who's got multiple subcontractors. They've all got their defined scope and they're all trying to limit what they're involved with and trying to limit their exposure, limit their risk. Um, and therefore, collating that information at the very end, as Gary says, is very challenging. 
Um, and I think the, this, the need for a safety case and a, and a golden thread and, and a def definition of what that information management looks like at the very beginning, I think it's going to be key to that. And, and people we've been talking to, there's lots of concerns with this as, as we go through a transition period um, about this causing delays. You know, the, the fact that a named individual is going to be accountable for a certain stage of, of the project and then they hand over to another named individual. And, and there's lots of concerns about it's going to delay projects, delay program. But I think if it's done well, and as Gary says, it's set at the very beginning, um, it should be a relatively smooth process because it should be the council person at the very end of the project have a say at the beginning what needs to be inputted to the in, in collected throughout the design and that transition of information is intended for that end user whereas at the minute we have been we have a bin model typically with design and your mechanical trunks uh, contractor will have a bin model for clash detection and your structural contracts have a bin model for um, specific to efficiencies in the design and they just don't meet up at the end and I think this this process really is intended that this handover of information to the end end user should be a smooth transition. That's 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 the, um, the real aim of it. I think when we look at um, yeah. current situation and you talk, Chris, about the various different BIM models, it is sometimes a wonder we actually build anything. We 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 make our lives so difficult, um, and. Um, and the, 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 the we you know the excuse I often hear is oh that's going to delay things it's going to take make things take too long we need to just change our behaviour and culture if we start these things early enough uh, build them robustly enough they'll actually save us time money make us more efficient and deliver everything that we are we work so hard to deliver in a far easier way. Absolutely, Ben. Did you have anything you wanted to come in with on that one? Or? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the answers in your. Uh, is actually set out in in uh, by following ISO 19650 because what that enables you to do each party can have their own exchange information requirements in which you are defining what it is that you need to be delivered and and that's a contractual thing once it's once once it's there because that that is that goes out as as part of the uh, as part of the um, employer's requirements and indeed. For, for a contractor, it's the, the requirements for their subcontractors. So I think there's a lot. You know, a CDE is a fantastic thing. It will record the who's done what and when. It will enforce a particular approvals process on particular items uploaded. It'll do all these wonderful things, but it can only do what it's being asked to do. So the great the great advantage of having the, of following the standards is that it gives you a way of making those deliverables contractual for your supply chain and then you can and then you can you, you know you you've got a, a a sense of responsibility yeah and i think i think as well you know, there's the we're getting asked now to contribute to uh developers and uh, other clients how how they determine this level of responsibility and the question was about you know where does the responsibility sit and what management, who looks after the management of this data collection? Um, and we're being asked to advise on who within the procurement process would need to be in charge of this. And it, and it looks to be quite well defined in the, in the, in the, in the bill. You know, we have the principal designer, principal contractor. Um, are they going to be responsible for this capture? Are they going to be responsible for collating this data? Um, but as, as Ben suggests, there, there is guidance out there already. There's also guidance that's going to be coming out in the future. Um, but unfortunately, until until this is all, all the legislation is in place, we are still guessing a little bit. You know, it isn't clearly defined. But the fact that we're talking about it is important because it is going to be such a fundamental change to our industry that we all need to be um, jenning up on it as soon as possible. Absolutely. I think we've just... Um lost Gary there for a second but I'm sure he'll be back with us <laughs> momentarily. Um, one question that I did come in that sort of picks up on the, the stuff that you've been talking about, it was originally addressed to you specifically Chris but I think it'd be great um, to get broader views. Um, it was is there a single piece of information required at the very beginning of the golden thread and or is that a too simplistic of a way of looking at it? Is there a single piece of information required at the beginning of the golden thread? Yeah, well, like if there is, what is that? I suppose what um, 
Ben's Ben's suggestion there, you know, about this about the the, the um, CDE, you know, that that is going to be what the term I've heard is the the, the, the BIM request strategy, or the, the information request strategy, at the very beginning. Um, and again, it comes back to this idea of the, the, the end user, the accountable person. It's their asset that they need to manage and they need to operate a level of safety in. They need to be the ones who say, I need the, in, this information captured in this format because I'm going to operate this safety case in a certain manner. Um, and I think that's probably the, the fundamentals to it. My, my understanding of how it's going to work, and again, we're, we're all taking an educated guess here, but um, we touched on it earlier about the has ID. It's going to be that buildings are designed now with a greater level of robustness because the person at the very end is going to scrutinize what's being designed throughout and a lot of the value engineering exercises that we do in the industry they will be not eliminated but i think they will be focused more on competency and resilience than fees because if you're a named individual who's got responsibility for a building um, i can't see how you would ever want to start reducing the level of safety in a building saves on fees throughout design you know i think it's i think it's, it's a fundamental idea of change so I, I suppose the answer to the question in, in short is defining very early on exactly what it is that the end user needs the accountable person needs and then from there that has an identification exercise the data capture will evolve as the design evolves as well brilliant um they're perfect ben did you have anything that you wanted to add there no, just uh, just that I think that what is defined should be issued out as part of the information um, at uh, you know for, for contract the tender. So these are these are more soft deliverables. So they should be you know if you like a section of your EIRs for whether you are you know and now we now we are clear that there are there isn't just one EIR. There is an EIR for everybody who employs somebody else. Um, they, you know that that should that should uh, you know solve the problem. Excellent. Um, we have had a question come in and it sort of picks up on something that you said at the start of your presentation, Ben, about what do we do about the golden thread retrospectively? What what are people supposed to do now about older projects if someone's, you know, the building manager of a building that is already existing, but this information doesn't exist, is there anything that can be done? Does anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> uh, I mean, there are ways, obviously, that you can digitise non-digital information and collate it into into those systems. But really, you know, the whole point is that you know what what Judith Hackett discovered. Uh, you know, she went back to try and find out. You know, the, the timeline and the decision-making processes. Um, it, it's really, you know, even with something with, 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 you know, with such a, a laser focus on what actually happened, it, it's really hard to, to do. So I think unless you are doing it real time as you go along and capturing the information that has been defined to be asked for, um, I, I can't see that you can re really do this retrospectively. I mean, I don't know what anybody else thinks. I just, I just don't think it's going to be possible. Yeah. It's a, it's a huge challenge. It's a really good question. Um, and there are um, 12,500 buildings odd, I don't know the exact number, roughly how many buildings in the UK, which this legislation will apply to. Um, and, you know, we're working on a lot of projects at the minute, high rise residential buildings, loads of them are single stair, loads of them are 1960s, 70s build, um, decaying levels of concrete, penetration through compartment walls whether you've got a smoke control system in the stair or the corridor that's ever been tested or in use, buildings at that height with no sprinklers, you know, there's, how do you determine a level of safety in something like that where you'd have to go in and do 3D scanning, you'd have to go and generate a model for that building, and then you could, there are ways of doing that, videogrammetry, the you know, methods around that, but then how do you quantify that the, the efficacy of each of those systems? How do you quantify the ability of a structure that's been upstood for 60 years to resist a fire. It's incredibly difficult. Um, and, I, and again, I think it's a real head scratcher. I don't think the industry's got a clearly defined answer just yet. But at the minute, the legislation is focused on that particular asset portfolio and it will apply to those existing buildings. So it's a real challenge. Absolutely. Gary, did you have anything that you wanted to add there? 
Jordan, I'm sorry, my internet's been no, crashing in and that's out. Okay. I, wasn't, I could see you, but I wasn't sure if you were quite there or not. Um, the question was just sort of how do you apply the golden thread retrospectively to building? Is it possible to buildings that already it, exist? It, it doesn't. So we, we, we're we challenged by this quite often at Skanska. And um, so what, the, the challenge for us is looking at the existing records. There, there's an expectation of fire resistance. Uh, we've got to deliver to current standards on, on, on refurbishments and, and, and rebuilds and so on. And the client often wants to retain as much of the existing structure and fire protection as possible. The sad thing is that we often can't find what that original record looks like. So we can't validate what's already there. We can't patch and repair. We can't measure its fire resistance. So there's a lot of wasted asset that we can't really make future use of because we can't validate what's already there. Um, the struggle I have with this, the challenge for me, is that the Regulation 38 information requirement has been a part of building regulations for many, many, many years. This is not a new thing that's come about because of Grenfell. It's just not being paid attention to. So all this information we need should be there. It's always been part of building regs. It's not. Uh, and it's, it's our client and existing building owners who are paying the price for that. Absolutely. So we've also had another question come in about the idea of can, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it. They're, they're flooding in. So every time I pin one, they all go flooding down. Um, <laughs> there was a question around um, the idea of value engineering and whether value engineering, building safety and the golden thread can ever all work hand in hand. Is that something that we can say being a possibility? Jordan, for me, value engineering doesn't mean coming up with cheaper options. Value engineering is finding the right option and installing it correctly and certifying it first time round. That's where true value engineering comes in. Uh, there's far too much waste in the construction industry. Um, and we need to start focusing not on knocking down cost, cheaper products, we need to start focusing on getting it right first time, and certifying it and delivering it first time. That's where that's where real value will come, if you ask me. And the golden thread is absolutely capturing change. That is the point. Why was this decision made? Okay, so we've got this specified and we've now got something else. Why and how has that decision been made? And who has, who has made that, who has validated that that decision is suitable? You know, who are the people involved? That is the whole process. The whole point of this is to capture that because that's what has often been missing. Mm. Brilliant. I, I, I agree. I think, um, yeah, like I said before, I think this idea of competency will become more paramount than the idea of value engineering. I think I, I completely agree with Gary. You know, there's a lot more about value engineering than cutting costs, you know, a lot more about efficient, efficiencies yeah. um, and, and getting people involved early to give the correct advice. Um, but I do, I do think, we were talking about it earlier before the call, uh, uh, some of the smaller contracting firms will either deter from doing high rise residential or, the, or, or um, they, they'll go out of business because of the, the more onus placed on um, quality and more robust uh, construction. And I think the same could be said as well for, for some design uh, organizations as well. I think the, the mm. scrutiny now that designs and build are going to be come under because of this um, will will lead to the fact that competency will be a bigger bigger mark than, than necessarily cost. Well I think that's a good thing, Chris. You know, we, we need to we need to move on to the next level now, don't we? Uh, and we need to bring up all the lower tiers with us, but we need to move on and start delivering really strong design that 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 delivers first time. I'm going to try and swing through a couple more. We're not going to get to everyone's questions. So if there are ones that we, we can pass on to the panel, um, we will do that at the end. Um, so we've had a question here. Um, does the panel consider that a fire engineer will need to be retained client side on every project following the involvement pre-tender to ensure the continuity of the golden thread? Well, we're I mean, we're definitely seeing that. We're seeing more and more now that, you know, Typically, you're engaged early on. We have to for high-rise residential buildings now you know, for the for the gateway one pre-planning, uh, and then we're being asked either stay client side or work contractor side. Um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary on every job. I think it's due to complexity 
and, and more often than not, the minute the conversations around professional indemnity cover, whether a designer has got that cover or a contractor has got that cover, and where, whether we can complement that if they've got exclusions. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it would be mandated in law, but certainly I think the insurance industry, like 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 nearly all things in in the construction industry, will be led by insurance, and I think they will dictate that there will be greater greater involvement from fire engineering. Certainly, we're having trouble servicing our jobs and, and, and recruiting people at the minute with our demand. So yeah, it's it's a change that's happening. So so at Skanska, we we need our fire engineer right through to handover because we need our fire engineer to help us deliver a stage four design. We need to go into stage five construction. We need to take that engineer needs to take us through that construction, manage change, keep an eye to design. And at the end of that, uh, when we're through to handover, we need our fire engineer to convert the fire strategy we will do into a fire strategy that talks about what we did do. So we need that fire engineer all the way through that process because otherwise what we what we think we're going to deliver, we all know that what we start off thinking we're going to deliver often looks completely different at the end of the project. Uh, and that, that's just that, that's just construction. But if we haven't got the fire engineer coming on that journey with us, how do we know we're still meeting our fire safety objectives? Um, so it's an element all the way through for us, right through to the right through to the end to handover. Absolutely. And so I think one of the things that has been touched on in a couple of different answers, and we've got a number of questions about, is that idea of the cultural collaborative shift that needs to happen for this to be delivered properly. Um, first of all, we've had a couple of questions asking what you see the biggest barriers to that happening, but also are there ways that industry, can, is, are there solutions to that? Mm -hmm. This, I think, is a, but, I mean, this is such an enormous topic that you've just mm -hmm. thrown into now, which is, you know, going back to the why the construction industry is is so adversarial and not collaborative. And you know, all the way through, we've had uh, we've we've had uh, move after move to try and make it more collaborative. For me, I think the move towards um, BIM and digital process, and, and by BIM I don't mean models, I mean, I mean uh, you know, models of data. I, th I think that can only be achieved through real collaboration. So I think, I think this will be a, a move towards it. And I th the other thing that I would say, though I have to say I've been hearing about it for 20 years, um, I think uh, forms of insurance which are, which are um, you know, not company based but a project based where mm -hmm. you are where you are jointly taking liability um and you're you're all insured together so that then that then will has always been the idea has been this will always lessen that uh adversarial don't say what you've done kind of approach where where you know everybody's going to work together to try and uh, to try and do that so i think uh, you know, I, I've never understood why it's why I've been hearing about it for 20 years, and it's never really taken off. But for me, that would be, you, you know, joint joint uh, insurances, project-based insurances would be a big thing. But uh, I think you raise a good point there, Ben. Um, definitely, because people are protecting their own position, and that's half the time we don't have true collaboration. And I understand why they need to do that. Um, but so we we. We've got a couple of jobs and one particularly large infrastructure project where all of the different specialists come together and when you join that project, you're all given, uh, you're all part of the project. So you're supplying the service into the project, but there is one common knowledge base, insurance base, one copy, common operating platform and you're just subcontracted into that platform. Uh, and then everyone has, to, uh, has uh, a project uh, email address. No one knows who's employed by who because you're all employed by the one email address. And we've got designers coming in there from from Spain, uh, across the UK. We're delivering into the UK, and that is a project that's working because we've got true collaboration there. There's no individual companies taking individual risks. It's a collective risk that we need to deliver a sound project. 
but that that's that's a, a novel approach and uh i think before we get that across the whole of construction there's some time to go but too much of the time is spent protecting you know, people's uh, individual and company responsibilities and we need to move away from that you're right ben Brilliant. Chris, any thoughts on that just before we wrap up? I've, I've never heard the idea of a project-based insurance uh, before. That's, I've taken a note. That's, that's a really interesting concept. But I mean, you know, the idea of multidiscipline um, design supposedly is to overcome that um, adversarial position, but you're always going to have client and, uh, and contractor or consultant relationships, designer relationships. And if you can get beyond that, then I think that would alleviate that barrier. Um, but yeah, I, I, it is, it's, it's a huge question, a whole different topic, I think. We'll probably have an hour talking about just that in itself. Well, we might have to arrange that one too. <laughs> I think you've given me two more webinars to get on the books today, so at least. Um, so thank you so much. I'd, I'd love to say thank you to the three of you. It's been a really great conversation. I've learned thank a lot. You. I know our audience has. To our audience, I'm very sorry to anyone's questions we didn't get to. We'll make sure those are passed along. Um, Again, this is available on demand. Um, and I just would like to flag up that we have a whole host of other events coming up. So please do check out um, our events websites, which are accessible from all three of our brands. Um, I'd also just like to thank, say thank you to Trimble Viewpoint for enabling today's conversation to happen. Um, so that was a really great um, session. And I'd just like to say thank you to all involved. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.